Welcome to today's discussion on the skeletal system. This is our second body or organ system after the integumentary system. And today we're going to be looking at uh, section 6.1 through 6.5 in the Blossom text. 6.6 uh, .6 and 6.7 are not areas that we will be discussing. Now, the first thing to always think about when we talk about different body systems is to start off with what are the functions of that system? You've already been introduced to the very basics of this idea way back in lab one, back in lecture one. And you know, for example, the skeletal system is all the bones of the body. It's also the cartilage at the ends of those bones. And you know a couple of things. You know that the skeletal system uh, supports the body weight, right? It helps us to have a body weight. It helps uh, facilitate movement. Now think about this for a second. Bones themselves do not move, right? Bones themselves do not move, but the bones are connected to many of our skeletal muscles. And it's the muscular system in coordination with the skeletal system where movement is uh, derived. So don't don't say that bones allow uh, or bones are, are responsible for movement, right? Let's leave the muscular system as the movement system. And uh, bones are protecting many of our internal organs. Uh, this makes sense. For example, the brain is protected by the cranial bones or the um, the heart and lungs are protected by the rib cage and the sternum, or you can see the spinal cord is protected by the by the vertebra. Inside, uh, not all, but many of our bones, uh, there is blood cell production going on. That's a process called hematopoiesis. We'll see that. Um, I'll go ahead and type that word out here now. Um, but hematopoiesis is the formation of blood cells. And then finally, the uh, bones are storing and releasing a lot of minerals and uh, like calcium and phosphate, and there is fat stored in the medullary cavity. So all of these things are going on with the skeletal system. So those are pretty, most of those are pretty obvious. A couple of those might be new to your understanding that this is a very vibrant uh, system. The bones are communicating and metabolically speaking to other organs as well. Those are more complex topics that you'll learn more about in the future. But just don't think of bones as a bucket of sticks, right? There's a lot more going on than just uh, what maybe perhaps meets the, the eye. So we said already, bones protect internal organs protect us from damaging those organs. And there is a mention here uh, early on in the chapter about a, 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 a problem with the vertebra, a curvature of the vertebra called scoliosis. I'm going to hold off on that conversation. And at the end of this presentation, or toward the end, I'm going to show you a couple more images and scoliosis will be a part of that conversation. So definitely read through this section, but I'm going to, to uh, set this up a, and uh, discuss this la later on. We're going to talk about scoliosis and kyphosis uh, later in our time. As said, the bones are storing minerals specifically calcium and phosphorus okay um, phosphate is a different is a form of phosphorus so calcium and phosphate you learned in the lab last week that the bones are made up of two important things that bones are made up of collagen and that bones are made up of a calcium phosphate combination uh, sort of like a cement and those, uh, the calcium phosphate and the calcium are the main components of your bones, but it isn't stagnant. 
we'll see as we go through this conversation that that calcium and phosphorus is released and added to the bones. Your bones are constantly being modified throughout your life. And there are a couple more important things going on is that inside your bone, especially in your long bones, there is yellow marrow, uh, the yellow bone marrow, and that is essentially a source of fat. And fat, one component of fats is triglycerides. You may have heard of triglycerides. Triglycerides are the fats that are stored in your, in your fat tissue, in your adipose. And some of that uh, fat is uh, stored and released also from your bones. And then also in your bones, uh, there's red bone marrow, and this is where hematopoiesis occurs. So there's the word that I did not type a moment ago, but hematopoiesis, but I will tell you this, hematopoiesis is also called hemopoiesis. These are equivalent terms, uh, they're interchangeable, but hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis, note that the prefix hemato and the prefix hemo both refer to blood. If you cut into some of your bones, now this is cutting into the head of the femur. The femur, as you're learning, is the largest bone in the body. It is the bone of your thigh. And this is a significant site of hematopoiesis. If you look at any of the schematic drawings of the femur, uh, many of the images where you're labeling long bone anatomy, which we'll see in a minute, will show you that at the proximal head or the proximal end of the femur, it shows as red. And that red is evidence that there is red bone marrow that is the site of this hematopoietic process or the formation of your blood. You can also see here that down the core of the femur is yellow marrow. So that's a really quick introduction to the major functions and uh, what's going on with bone structures. Do make sure that you're taking a look at these questions and doing the vocabulary checks at the end. Also in lab last week, uh, you were introduced to, in the first of the two sections in the Green Lab Manual, you were introduced to bones coming in multiple distinct categories. Uh, this is primarily based upon shape. And just to look at this diagram, uh, some of your bones are long bones. Again, here's the femur. We recognize the femur. It has the very large head. And it's, a, it's just the largest bone of the body. You'll, you'll become very familiar uh, with recognizing some of these main bones in isolation. So the femur is a long bone, but so would, for example, your uh, tibia and fibula and even the phalanges and the metatarsals in the foot they're also long bones there are irregular bones your vertebra your 24 vertebra are a good example of irregular bones as is for example your ethmoid bone sutural bones uh, when the cranial bones fuse together to form the sutures now you're learning that this suture here is part of the lambdoid suture. But let me zoom in just a little bit. But when the suture is formed, oftentimes little extra piece of the bone are formed. These are the sutural bones. I won't be focusing on those. They don't have individual names. It's just a phenomenon where the sutures come together. Sometimes you'll get these little bones that kind of look like a little island. Those are the sutural bones. There are flat bones. Now, flat bones are not necessarily flat on the table, but if you were to take your fingers and run them along the bone, this is the frontal bone, if you were to run your fingers uh, around the frontal bone, you would realize your fingers really aren't changing uh, very much. So your frontal bone, your sternum are good examples of flat bones. Short bones are the bones primarily found in the carpal region, Remember, you have eight carpals in each wrist, and you have seven tarsals in each uh, ankle. Those are great examples of short bones. And then finally, there are sesamoid bones. 
Uh, the patella is an example of that. A sesamoid bone is a bone that is embedded in a tendon. So as, as you learn more about the knee in lab in a week or so, you'll see that the patella, the kneecap bone, is actually embedded in the tendon, the patellar tendon that uh, comes across the front of the knee. So the bone is actually embedded in a tendon, so it is a sesamoid. Sesamoid bones are also quite flat in shape, but because of their uh, embedding in the tendon, they are considered sesamoid. In here, a little bit more of what I just said, but I think you'll find that this is very comfortable information. Uh, as you're learning bones, do think about what type of bone does it belong to, which shape bone. So as you learn the, the long bones of the appendicular skeleton, right, the, and they're all listed here. When you think about the arms of the, uh, the legs of the arm, right, or uh, bones of the leg, or when you think about the uh, bones of the hand or the feet, those are all long bones. Short bones, again, are the carpals and tarsals, flat bones, like I said, are many of the skull bones, and as well as the uh, scapula, the shoulder blade, the sternum, and the ribs. Oh, I forgot to say the ribs. The ribs are also uh, good examples of flat bones. Again, they, they have a curvature to them, don't they? But they have a flat surface. Irregular bones, just like it says, are the bones that have just an irregular shape. Think vertebra, think also the ethmoid. Sesamoid bones, again, ones that are found in the uh, tendon, and uh, their, their name is, uh, is derived from the word sesame seeds. So you just think of something kind of small uh, and, again, embedded in the tendons. Table here that goes through these with you and gives some examples. And that is a quick and short run through through section 6.2. Point two, again, be sure to answer the questions and answer the matching activity here. Moving on to 6.3 and bone structure. Uh, again, this is information that was introduced to you uh, in both the uh, histology lab and lab two and in the skeletal system lab, lab three. And that is what is the gross anatomy of a bone? When I look at this diagram, this is what I would refer to as the long bone anatomy. This is the femur, and this is these are the, the structures and the components of bones. Now, this is not true just of the femur, but true of all of the long bones. So what we find is that there's cartilage on either and on both ends of the bone. Cartilage is going to be present wherever the bone is going to articulate with another bone. We'll see in the next conversation that where two bones come together, that is considered a joint. And there is cartilage at almost all joint structures where it helps to protect the, uh, the moving ends of those bones. The type of cartilage here is hyaline cartilage, the most common type of cartilage. Remember that this is an avascular tissue. Around the outside of the bone, around the outside of the bone, all around the outside of the bone as my pointer goes around. This is compact bone. This is the type of bone that you looked at under the microscope. This is the bone, we'll look at it again, that has osteons in the central canal, the canaliculi, and the lamellae with the osteocytes. Internal to that, deep to the compact bone, is spongy bone. Spongy bone is where uh, hematopoiesis occurs here in some bones. You see the red color up here at the proximal end of the femur. And spongy bone also travels where my pointer is going, sort of travels along the inner edge of the compact bone. We are not looking at spongy bone under the microscope. So that is not something you'll be responsible for, but I want you to know the general location of spongy bone. I'll also say it now, we'll say it again later, when you hear about diseases like osteoporosis, right, you've heard of osteoporosis, it's a disease where the bone becomes more porous, more, uh, less, uh, less structurally sound, and in elderly people, 
Osteoporosis makes their bones more weak and makes them more open to fracture. Osteoporosis is a disease of the of the spongy bone, of the spongy bone. So you might think, oh, it's the breakdown of the outer edge of the bone that's making it more fragile, but in fact, it is a disease where the biggest changes are seen in the spongy bone. On the inside, along the diaphysis, the shaft of the bone, this is where you find the yellow bone marrow. As I mentioned, this is basically just fat um, and is stored here, and there is some interaction with that, those triglycerides being released. This is the reason why you add a bone a, a, into soup, right, a soup bone, and that fat leaches out of the bone, giving flavor to the soup. This bone marrow is found in the medullary cavity. And then there are layers. So around the bone, there is the periosteum. Peri means around, like perimeter. Osteo is a prefix meaning bone. So the periosteum is simply this connective and epithelial layer that travels and, and covers the entire bone. If you were to find a bone out in the backyard that a dog buried there years ago, it would not have the periosteum and it would not have the cartilage. You would be you would find just a bone, uh, but the cartilage and the periosteal layers on the outside do not survive over time. On the inside of the bone, at the border between the compact and spongy bone, that layer is referred to as the endosteum, endo meaning within. So within the bone, you have the endosteum. So those terms tell you where they are, endosteum on the inside, periosteum on the outside. Keep in mind, and something that perhaps is not the most obvious, but bones are living organs. They must have oxygen. Inside bones, there are cells that have a metabolism. These cells must have oxygen, nutrients, react to hormones. Bones also release some hormones that help to regulate other cellular processes. So while it's not obvious, there must be blood vessels coming in and out of the bone. And don't forget, your bone cells are being made inside the bones, so they must have a way of getting out. So there are nutrient arteries, uh, just a name for the arteries that penetrate into the bone and they pass through, it's not labeled here, but it is mentioned in your lab book, they pass through foramina, right? Foramina are the openings in a bone. So along a bone, if you were to take a look at a femur, they're not huge openings, but there are these little divots. They almost look like little uh, defects, if you will, in the bone. And just know that if this was a bone in your body, that there would be uh, arteries that would travel in and out of those bones, of those foramina. Okay. Now, lastly, the regions of the bone. On each end of the bone is the epiphysis, or the epiphyses, plural. Here is the proximal epiphysis. Down here would be the distal epiphysis. Then there is a region here in the middle called the metaphysis, the metaphysis, one on each end. And then the diaphysis is the term for the shaft of the bone, the diaphysis. Now, for this word, for these words to make any sense, you need to understand or appreciate what physis means. Physis is a root word that means um, that means growth. Okay, growth. So I'm just going to write that word here, epiphysis, right? Uh, physis means growth. So, and we know that epi, like the epidermis, means on or upon. Sorry for my typing skills here. And dia. Oops. Dia means across. Think diameter, right? To measure the diameter, you're measuring across. Okay. So when you hear these words, uh, epiphysis, right? Epiphysis, epiphysis, what you're saying is that it is on the growth. On the growth. 
and we'll see in a moment that your bones grow from the growth plate and that is here in the epiphysis region so the bones are growing from their ends right on the growth plate and then diaphysis you will we'll understand later on that bones do grow larger in their diameter so the shaft of the bone uh, from a two-year-old to an adult the shaft of the bone is growing in diameter again that's the way that i remember these terms so at the ends of the bone is the growth plate or are the growth plates okay and um, the the metaphysis is the area that actually contains the growth plate the other name for that growth plate is the epiphyseal plate and we'll see later on that the epiphyseal plate is actually a region composed of cartilage it's interesting uh, bones actually are cartilage before they become bone so we'll talk more about that as we get later in the in the next section in 6.4 but bones are first formed as cartilaginous structures that cartilage is going to then differentiate into bone bones are going to elongate also from this epiphyseal plate which is a cartilaginous region let's take a look uh, at this figure this is 6.30 and let's just zoom in here for a moment and let me introduce you to a few more features about bone so here again we're looking at the femur I know it's the femur I see this big rounded head only found on the femur I see the cartilage shown here by the artist I can see the red bone marrow represented here and here is that uh, line that one sees now in a young bone and I'll show you a picture of this later as well in a young bone there is a gap right here that gap is the growth plate in an adult bone that gap closes to become the epiphyseal line so here this is a line so this line this epiphyseal line tells me that the bone has reached its adult length and as the text says here uh, this uh, the change from the epiphyseal plate to the epiphyseal line happens somewhere as we reach adulthood some bones uh, fuse this epiphyseal plate closes down earlier than others but again the epiphyseal plate becomes the epiphyseal line some bones it's earlier some bones it's later we'll see that in women uh, who reach their adult height earlier in life than men that this process oftentimes happens earlier as well so back to this image again I wanted to show you that epiphyseal line here uh, in uh, around and in your bones there are a number of different cells that I want you to be aware of so here we're looking at the outside of the bone again we learned in the previous image that that's the periosteum that sort of a cellular fibrous connective tissue layer that would peel off the bone or disintegrate off from a bone but once we get deep to that periosteum now you have compact bone compact bone is composed of you know osteocytes the cells of the bone and those osteocytes are found in lacunae recall lacunae are the residual places or the residential homes if you will of the osteocytes this is true not only in bone but in cartilage recall too that chondrocytes also live or hang out in these spaces called lacunae so that is a, uh, a shared characteristic between bone and cartilage that the, the mature cells hang out in these spaces called lacunae as we look inside uh, at the endosteum sort of that border between the uh, compact bone and the spongy bone I want to introduce you to a couple of different types of cells found in bone so far the only cell type that you've heard about from me are osteocytes osteocytes again they live in the lacunae they live in the lacunae but there are three additional cell types that I want you to learn about that are found in bone number one 
there are osteogenic cells osteogenic cells osteogenic make bone genic think genesis in the beginning god created right genesis so osteogenic cells are bone stem cells bone stem cells these are cells that come to life if you will when you break a bone these bone these cells are just waiting for some sort of trauma some sort of event where they have to come to life and they start making new cells osteogenic cells first make osteoblasts osteoblasts you know from the vocab that blast means to germinate you've already learned about fibroblasts right these are cells that make fibers in connective tissue now we have osteoblasts they are building so i remember blast means to build so the osteoblast cells are building new bone and then finally there are osteoclasts be careful only one letter different osteoclast recall from the vocab clast means to break down so these are cells that are actively breaking down bone and that may at first seem kind of odd but as we'll continue to discuss your bones are not static sticks that just exist in your body connect to muscles and allow your movement of your skeleton but bone is constantly being formed broken down regenerated and this is part of that process whereby your bones are releasing calcium and phosphorus so these osteoclasts are are very important cells to that breaking down a bone and then the osteoblast cells are building it back up once an osteoblast does its job of building bone then the osteoblast differentiates that is it changes to become an osteocyte so osteoblasts become osteocytes the way i think of this osteoblasts are busy building the bone they're busy knitting together all the components of the bone and then once the the osteoblast has built its home it sort of goes into a semi-retirement as an osteocyte and the osteocyte then lives out its life living in that lacunae so that is what you would find oftentimes in a long bone like the femur we also have flat bone flat bones have a slightly different architecture and what we'll see in a flat bone is that there's a layer of spongy bone sandwiched in between two layers of periosteum what is different about this is that there is no endosteum so just just know that flat bones like the parietal bone or the frontal bone just have a slightly different architecture there is no endosteal layer you just go straight from periosteum to spongy bone to periosteum and if we were looking at a more detailed picture this would actually be covered by the skin of the scalp and then deep inside we would see the brain matter here where my pointer is now by the time that you are listening to this presentation you have already had lab three and you have started your journey of learning the bones of the body and in lab three you were also introduced to bone markings for the next couple of labs labs four and labs five you are going to be working on learning not only the muscles of the body but also learning about the bone markings some books call these the bony markings the bone markings other books might just call these the surface features of bones i will refer to them as bone markings now basically <coughs> excuse me basically the bone markings are the pieces the parts the areas of the bones there's a lot of them folks and we're not learning all of them we're learning many of them but we're certainly not learning all of them here is a list of different types of bone markings notice some of them are just features 
for example, the head of the bone, the head of the femur, right? It's a rounded surface. Other of these bone markings are really important. For example, a tuberosity is a rough surface. Uh, it's a rough surface on a bone where tendons attach. Recall that tendons attach to bones or muscles attach to bones through tendons. So we're going to see a number of tuberosities where the tendons attach to the bone. There are openings and holes in bones. The, the most common name for a hole in a bone is a foramen. Uh, you saw this, for example, in the vertebral foramen, the, the big hole in all of the vertebra. There are flat regions like fossas, and there are grooves like a sulcus. There are bigger canals, uh, and again, there's the foramen word again. There are slits called fissures. There are canal-like openings called meatuses, and there are air-filled spaces in some of our bones, like the nasal sinus or the, the frontal sinus that you'll see uh, prominently in the frontal bone. So uh, many, many, many of the bone markings you're learning have these words included in them. It's really critical that you learn what these different bone markings are. And that's why, as a part of the pre-lab for lab four, there were vocabulary terms for you to fill out on one of those forms. Uh, that's all included in your lab manual, but it's important that you create a study guide and you write out those definitions with examples as you begin to learn this really important body of knowledge. Here are just a couple of pictures right, to show you, and you'll be learning most of these, that these different, uh, these different uh, bone markings, these different surface structures, you know, crests, like the crest of the moon, the very top of the pelvic bone is called the crest. A sulcus is a groove. Uh, a tuberosity uh, doesn't look like anything here, but if you had the actual bone in your hand, you would see sort of a roughened area where a tendon attaches. A fossa is an indented, smooth region. Um, a facet is a flat region. A turbicle is a, a sort of a, an outpouring, sort of a, a bulge that comes out of the bone. Uh, again, a fissure is a slit. We see that here in the back of the orbit. The sphenoid has this fissure. There are canals, uh, this one for tears. Uh, there are the sinuses, air-filled pockets within bones, for example, the frontal sinuses. Um, there are protuberances. These are uh, small uh, areas where there's a projection. Not quite a process. A process is something that sticks out significantly from a bone, but a protuberance would be uh, another type of projection. So you get the idea that there are many, many of these bone markings, and you will be very, very busy over the next couple of weeks learning these. Uh, I will not be going through these in this presentation. Uh, you have your green lab manual and these bone markings are also going to be included in chapters 7, axial skeleton, and chapter 8. So if you were to review these chapters, and I would certainly recommend it, uh, but chapter 7 has everything about the axial skeleton, chapter 8 on the, on the appendicular skeleton, Again, these are not chapters I'll be lecturing on as you've already learned this material in the lab. So back to those bone cells. I introduced them to you for a moment. And these cells are critical to the recruitment and the formation of the bony components. Again, bone is composed of a relatively small number of cells. Keep in mind, this is a connective tissue, loosely arranged cells. These cells are surrounded by a matrix of collagen fibers. So these cells, these osteoblasts, are making the collagen fibers, and they're also recruiting and collecting the salt crystals, for example, the calcium phosphate and the calcium carbonate that are found in your bones. Together, all of the crystal uh, inorganic component of your bone is called hydroxyapatite. 
hydroxyapatite. That's a fun word. But hydroxyapatite is the bony sort of think of the cement sort of uh, structure that is making bones uh, in part strong along with the collagen. In lab, uh, there was a small section where you learned what happens to a bone that is put in acid, right? And in that little demonstration or in that section, you learn that bone that is exposed to acid that the hydroxyapatite, the mineral component, breaks down and the bone becomes very flexible. Whereas if you take a bone and you put it into heat, right, you put it into the oven for a few hours, that bone becomes very brittle because the, uh, the collagen has been denatured in the high heat, in the high heat and the crystals, the uh, cement, if you will, right, no longer has the strength and the bone becomes more brittle. So let's talk about, again, the different cells that we find. I've already mentioned them. We have osteoblasts, osteocytes, osteogenic cells, and osteoclasts. Here's a nice diagram of them. Let me go in the order that they are basically formed. Okay, so osteogenic cells. Again, they are found on the outside in the periosteum. They're also found in the endosteum, so they're found on the outside edges, if you will, of the compact bone. The osteogenic cells are the stem cells. Again, think of them as cells that are kind of waiting around, waiting for something to go wrong, or simply waiting to uh, really increase the production of bone. Osteogenic cells, when they are activated, become osteoblasts. Again, blast, formation of, uh, this is going to be the germinating cells that make bone. These are the cells uh, that are very metabolically active. They are gathering the calcium and the phosphates and the carbonate uh, ions for the uh, hydroxyapatite, and they are actively making the collagen that helps to make bone so strong. Once those osteoblasts have built the bone matrix, those cells then differentiate, right? They become different. They go into what I call retirement. They change their shape. Notice that osteoblasts are plump and happy, and osteocytes get a little thinner, right? They're not as metabolically active. Their job is to hang out in the lacunae and to maintain bone tissue. These three cells, osteogenic, osteoblast, and osteocyte, are connected. They're related. They come one from another. The fourth type of bone cell, however, is not related. It, it does not come from, it does not derive from the same pathway. And those are the osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are another type of macrophage. Macrophages are derived from blood cells and osteoclasts, remember back in the skin, we had Langerhan cells. Langerhans cells were phagocytic cells that hung around in the stratum spinosum of the epidermis. And they were able to wander around and they're part of your immune system. And they're able to uh, go up and help destroy or to phagocytose uh, maybe a virus or a bacterium that penetrates into your epidermis. Osteoclasts also are phagocytic they're able to chew away at the bone. Remember, clast means to break down. The fancy word for breaking down is resorption. We say that the bone is resorbed or undergoes resorption. Okay, so osteoclasts resorb bone. You can see here another interesting fact about osteoclasts. Notice that the artist here correctly drew in six nuclei. So osteoclasts are a multinucleated cell. You have in passing seen another multinucleated cell. Do you remember what that was? Correct. Skeletal muscle. Remember skeletal muscle also is multinucleated. So now this is our second multinucleated cell that we've been introduced to. Also notice that the artist drew in a lot of little blebs. Uh, I know they're small. That represents lysosomes, my friends. Lysosomes, recall, are organelles that are breaking things down. So these lysosomes are releasing enzymes. 
which are helping to break down or resorb the bone. As a child, you have a lot of osteoblasts, right? Building bone, making bone thicker, bigger, longer, stronger. As a adult, you have a, as a child, let's back up. As a child, you also have osteoclasts, which are helping to shape the bones. Have you ever thought about that? Right? When you look into a box of bones, every femur looks essentially the same. Every humerus looks essentially the same. Every bone, right, has a unique shape. Well, what caused that unique shape is the dance between the building of the bone, osteoblasts, and the t breaking down of the bone or the carving of the bone by the osteoclasts. So think of the osteoclasts as almost being like the sculptor, right? That helps to break down, carve out, and create the unique shapes that we see in bones. It's an absolutely phenomenal and in interesting story. So as a child, your osteoblasts are very, very busy. Your osteoclasts are doing their job. As an adult, the balance between osteoclasts and osteoblasts is pretty even, although there is a change, you know, always in our bones. And as we get older, what happens is that our osteoblasts get a little bit weaker, right? They don't create as much bone. And in some diseases like osteoporosis, osteoclasts actually gain an advantage. And bones get broken down faster than they get built. And that imbalance leads to a number of different bone diseases. The one that you've heard of, again, is osteoporosis. Again, what, what's written here, read through this. This will all make good sense to you. Uh, this is a continuation of what I've described as well as the histology that you've learned about bone. So here are the great little bone video, and then here are the four bone cells. Tells you what they're doing and where they're located. Okay, so it's a nice review table, table 6.3. We're focusing primarily on compact bone. Nice video here that helps you understand that in compact bone. Let's take a look at this figure. You have seen figures like this. Let's take a quick look at this again. We're looking at a section through a bone. Okay, this is just a small section through a bone. It is through the diaphysis of the bone, through the shaft of the bone. And around the outside, we see the peeling off of the periosteum. Then in the compact bone, we see these very familiar osteons. Now you know from lab that osteons are long columns. Osteons are the entire longitudinal length of the bone. Okay, So we see some of that here. So we see these osteons, these uh, circular arrangements. And we know that in the center of each osteon, there's a central canal. That central canal contains blood vessels, both arteries and veins. Arteries are in red, veins are in blue. Yellow is our universal color for nerve structure. So we see nerves, arteries, and veins traveling through the central canal. So we see evidence here that the bone is an incredibly vascular tissue, right? Lots and lots of blood flow. As we go through the compact bone, these osteons we see are made up of these concentric or circular layers called lamellae. Okay. And inside those lamellae, we see these little divots. Those little divots are the lacunae. And you know that osteocytes are hanging out in those little divots in those lacunae. Also, if you look closely, you'll see that these layers and these lacunae and these cells are connected one to another through little canals. These little canals connect the lacunae, allowing the cells to get nutrients, oxygen, respond to hormones, send away their waste products. It's not labeled in this particular diagram, but remember those little canals are the canaliculi. Canaliculi, little canals. One last structure here is that notice that there is connection of blood vessels and nerves between one central canal 
and another central canal. The neighboring osteons talk to each other through these canals, and these canals are called the perforating canals. Perforating canals, they were described after a dude named Volkman. So you'll see Volkman's canals or perforating canals, same thing. And they are these connecting canals between the central canals, okay? Again, carrying blood and nerve tissue through there. As we move further in, uh, deep to the compact bone, that's where you then see the endosteum layer and finally the compact, or sorry, the spongy bone on the inside. This is uh, described as trabeculae. Trabeculae uh, is sort of, you know, it, it's, it's the way of describing a sponge. When you look at a sponge, you see all those spaces and all those spiky connectors. So the trabeculae are the spiky connectors, and then you see the hollowness, if you will, of the spongy bone. What you have most often seen is this image, right? This is that classic histological image of bone. You see it sort of as a tree trunk. You saw this clearly in lab, seven, or lab two, uh, in lab two, the histology lab, and you were asked to know all of those structures that I just went over, including the canaliculi. Refer back to your lab manual for any review on that. You'll also recall have a great resource of histology in the pre-lab video for lab two. So I've just gone through each of those pieces and parts, right? The osteon, the central canal, the Volkman or perforating canal as well the lacunae, the canaliculi. So let me go ahead and just highlight the six or seven things you need to know about bone. So we have the osteon. I need to remember to save this. Central canal. The perforating or Volkman's canals. Definitely know the lacunae. Know that the lacunae are holding the osteocytes. And that there is a connection between these structures called the canaliculi. So those are the things that you definitely want to know regarding the uh, substructures or the histology of compact bone. When it comes to spongy bone, again, I just want you to appreciate where it's located. Uh, we're not going to worry about any of the other specifics about the histology of this tissue. There are all sorts of diseases related to the bones. Um, Paget's disease is one that is um, an interesting one. This is basically where there is overactive osteoclasts, right? I've already talked to you about like osteoporosis, but here's another disease where there's an imbalance in that as well. And as a result, the bones become uh, defective uh, and start to change their shape uh, earlier in life. Inside the bone, lots of blood vessels. Lots and lots of blood vessels. Remember that there's going to be these nutrient foramina or foramen, right? Foramina, plural, that are going to come in and out of the bone, allowing for that blood to get inside the bone. This particular diagram is showing an adult bone. I know this for two reasons. One, it's labeling for me down here the epiphyseal line. Click on this. The epiphyseal line, recall, is only found in a bone of adult length. The other reason I know this is an adult bone, it's related, is that the blood vessels are continuous from the diaphysis all the way through the metaphysis and into the epiphysis. If we were looking at a younger bone, there would be a gap here. There would be a gap in the metaphysis and where the growth plate is, and the blood vessels would not penetrate through because remember that growth plate is cartilage, and cartilage does not have blood vessels. So there'd be a basically a damming here where there'd be no blood vessels passing from one side of the bone to the end of the bone. And that's another evidence that 
you're looking at an immature bone or one that has not yet reached its adult length. Also, just note for labeling, we have articular cartilage. This is simply saying this is the cartilage found on the end of the bones where the bone articulates with another bone, but you know that this is actually hyaline cartilage, the most common type of cartilage. That brings us to the end of section 6.3. Again, reminder, answer through these questions about bone, label this long bone anatomy. That'll be a great review as you prepare for the lab quiz and for the exam too. Little vocabulary check up here as well. Moving on to 6.4 and bone development. Now this is brand new. Many of the concepts described in 6.1 6.2, 6.3 were at least introduced in the lab. This section is brand, brand new when it comes to understanding bone tissue. The formation of bone, the formation of bone is called ossification, right? The process of forming new bone, ossification, you might also see the word osteogenesis, right? The formation in the beginning, the making of bone. There are two ways by which bone is formed in your body. One is called intramembranous ossification. As the name suggests, it happens within intra, a membrane, okay, intramembranous ossification. And the second one, endochondrial ossification, endo within cartilage, within cartilage, chondro. So we're going to see most of what I'll be talking about will be endochondrial ossification. Most of the bones in your body are made by this second uh, type of bone formation. Our skeleton is a replacement tissue. Your bone is not bone from the time it is formed. First, you lay down a mineral matrix, and then from there, we go to uh, cartilage is the first thing that's formed for most of the body skeleton and then during fetal development the cartilage is going to go from being a semi-solid cartilaginous structure made with chondroblasts and chondrocytes and will eventually become um, and remember that cartilage is avascular right so early you know cartilage is avascular and then eventually that cartilaginous template will undergo a change into bone. Okay, this is an example of differentiation, how one tissue or one cell type becomes different and changes over time. So let's start with the first one. I'm not going to get really crazy about this first one, and this is intramembranous ossification. This is the type of bone formation where you get your flat bones of your face, most of your cranial bones, and the clavicle. So you can see it's not a majority of the bones. So just think flat bones. If you just think flat bones are formed by intramembranous ossification, you will be fine. Okay. Remember that all connective tissues come from that middle layer of the early embryo called the mesoderm. And that mesoderm starts to form cells called mesenchymal cells, right? Mesenchymal cells come from the mesoderm, meso, meso. And these cells come together and they form basically these layers, okay? Basically, when I think of, and this is really oversimplifying it, but it's all I care about right now. Um, I always think of intramembranous ossification as poof. We go from um, cells, right, and we start making capillaries and other cells come along. But this is a type of bone formation where you don't have a cartilaginous intermediate. We go poof from mesenchymal tissue to bone. Okay, we go straight to bone without cartilage, and that's all I want you to know. Okay, this is your uh, flat bones. 
and this is called intramembranous ossification. Notice there's no chondro in its name. It does not involve a cartilaginous intermediate. Okay, so that's really all I care about. Look here at this picture. This is an example of flat bone. We saw this in a moment ago. Again, you have two layers of periosteum with a uh, and compact bone on either side of a um, spongy bone on the inside with that trabeculae, right? The spiky sections. My friends, that's it for that particular type of bone formation. Uh, this does begin during fetal development, as does this next type, the one I want you to know more about, and this is endochondrial ossification. Again, it has the word chondro in it, this prefix, this root word meaning cartilage. This is what most of your skeleton comes from. This is uh, bone, which replaces first hyaline cartilage. Now, the cartilage does not become the bone. Okay, it's not like it it becomes it, but it actually serves as a template, and we'll see how it kind of uh, is replaced by bone, right? It becomes sort of the sketch, if you will. If you've ever had a chance to go to a body worlds or a body uh, type exhibit, there was one in Grand Rapids a few years ago. There are exhibits set up around the country and the world. If you've ever seen a fetal, a, a fetus, um, if you were to shine a flashlight through a fetus, it's you can see right through it. The bones, again, are not yet bone. They are still cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is very glassy or clear in, a, in its appearance. Remember, too, that cartilage is avascular. So when you shine a flashlight through hyaline cartilage, it's sort of like looking through fine porcelain or through, uh, you know, fine dishes, right? You, it's translucent. It's not transparent, right? It's not perfect, but it's you, light passes through it. So that's what your early skeleton sort of looks like if you could imagine sort of a glassy, clear cartilaginous template. And here is sort of the basic timeline. First, you have a chunk of cartilage. That chunk of cartilage, remember, is avascular. It's avascular. Cartilage is not surrounded by periosteum. It is instead surrounded by perichondrium, right? It makes sense, right? Around the cartilage, there is a layer called the perichondrium. What happens is that during development, blood vessels start to knock on the door of the diast what will become the diathesis, right, the middle, the shaft region, the center of the cartilaginous template. As blood vessels penetrate into that, the blood now brings hormonal signals and also um, uh, bony cells start to come in and start to form in the center here. Now where that blood vessel penetrated in, that's the nutrient foramen, uh, carrying a nutrient artery. We call this region in the center the primary, make this larger, the primary ossification center, right? It's the first place where bone starts to form. So we get sort of this bony change in the center. That continues to occur, but notice that the epiphyses, right, the proximal and distal epiphyses are still completely cartilaginous. Moving on, the epiphysis also uh, gets knocked on by a artery and blood vessels start to permeate into the epiphyses. Uh, this happens later and so we call this the secondary ossification center. The same thing is happening on the other end, on the distal end. Notice, however, and I mentioned this a moment ago, that the blood vessels are here in the epiphysis there are separate blood vessels here in the diaphysis, but in the center, we still have that cartilage. This is still cartilage, and this is avascular. Remember those little eyeball-looking cells? You can see them here. This is the growth plate. This is the epiphyseal plate. The blood vessels are not contiguous. They cannot touch each other. This is what's going on throughout your childhood. Throughout your childhood, 
your bones re reflect this. If you took an x-ray, and I'll show you one later, you would see a gap right here where there is no bone and no blood vessels. And uh, this is the growth plate. Now, as we get to adult length and adult height, now the epiphyseal uh, plate is still here. Later on, we would see an epiphyseal line. We would see this cartilage completely go away. And we would then see these blood vessels connect as was in that previous, in, uh, that previous image. So this process that I'm describing here is endochondrial ossification. Endochondrial ossification. You can read about it here. I just described it to you. Now, bones, we know this, bones grow not only in diameter, but bones also grow in length. Okay, so how does this happen? I'm not going to have you learn all of the steps involved here. So I'm going to blue out some of this in a moment, but I do want you to know this, that the epiphyseal plate is the growth area of a long bone. It is a layer of hyaline cartilage where in immature bones, right, you still have that cartilage. And it's here that over time, the cartilaginous cells are going to divide and that is going to lead to a lengthening of the bone. So here is, uh, here is what I don't care about. From reserve zone down, I'm going to make this blue, right? Don't worry about this. Don't worry about learning the zones that are involved in this process. And don't worry about these proliferative and all of these zones. Okay, so I'm going to put a blue line a blue uh, area through this again blue represents areas that you don't need to worry about the content Oop. and make sure I get this right make this blue blue and save and I am not hitting something right I apologize but this area right here make a note to yourself this is It's not saving for you right now. I may have timed out. Let me make sure I haven't timed out. Let's see. If that ever happens, guys, if you think that sometimes uh, your questions aren't saving or something, um, the book will time out on itself sometimes. And that means that it's no longer sort of making, you know, uh, it's not longer really talking with the, with the, uh, the system and as a result you may find that changes you're making in your text or questions you're answering are not being saved so if that seems like it's happening um, just go back refresh your page and sometimes you may even have to log back in so we've already seen uh, this idea of the regions of the long bone uh, here uh, we see a growing bone the red lines represent the growth plate or the epiphyseal plate and then in a mature bone, that plate is replaced by a line. Uh, you actually can see this in an x-ray. The regions have not changed. The metaphysis is the region of the bone that contains the growth plate. Okay, metaphysis contains the growth plate. And we've already seen the word diaphysis before. I'm gonna show you a, a, a x-ray and a bone of this a little bit later. So bones grow in length. Right? and they grow in length through this elongation process at the growth plate. Bones also grow bigger in diameter. This is no surprise to you, right? Bones, a two-year-old's bones are not as big around as an adult bone. This sort of bone uh, change as they are getting bigger in diameter is called appositional growth. So that's a term you need to know, right? Appositional growth. Appositional growth is growing in diameter, growing in diameter. This actually uh, requires additional osteons, additional osteons to be added to the bone. So when you look at the compact bone of an adult versus the compact bone of a child, you will see that the compact bone is thicker and contains more osteon units. 
right? And that adding of those osteon units, the adding of the diameter is appositional growth. As throughout our life, our bones are constantly changing. You have um, about 5%, 5 to 10% of your skeleton is changing like every year sort of thing annually, okay? And this is a, 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 a scale, right, between the depositing of new bone with osteoblasts and the breakdown of bone through osteo, sorry, osteoblasts, if I misspoke, and the breakdown of bones with osteoclasts. And every five to 10 years, right, you have a very significant amount of your bones have been replaced. Now, bones are responding to hormones and all sorts of signals, but bones are also, of course, uh, prone to injury. They also respond to exercise and other activities. Uh, exercise is not only important for your muscles, but exercise is also very, very important for maintaining your bone density, right? Bone density. Now, that is uh, part of the conversation here in 6.6 .6 and 6.7, which we're not going to be describing this semester. But just know that exercise is important not only for building and maintaining muscle mass, but also for maintaining and building bone structure. There is a genetic disease called osteogenesis imperfecta, OI. Uh, this is a disease where the bones don't form properly and are very fragile. These are children, uh, you may have heard them called brittle bone disease, and they, they may be born even in the birthing process, they'll break bones, right? This is a very significant uh, genetic defect. And uh, the biggest problem here is typically the collagen is, uh, the collagen that these folks have is uh, defective and that leads to all sorts of issues, uh, as you can imagine. Now, let's take a look at this. Why would people with, with osteogenesis imperfecta not only have bone issues, but why would they also have fragile skin? Why would they also have loose joints? Why would they have brittle teeth? And why would they be prone to hearing loss? And I hope what you realize is that all of those things, skin, um, joint structures, we'll learn more about later, um, teeth, and in your ear, you have little bones, they're all made of collagen. So if you have defective collagen, not only are your bones going to be affected and be weak, but also your skin would be affected by defective collagen. Your joints, your uh, joints would be affected by that. We'll see that uh, joints have a lot of cartilage in them. Cartilage also has a lot of collagen in it. And your uh, teeth would be more brittle as would those little bones in your ear called the ossicles would also be oftentimes defective. So I'm going to say this now, it'll make more sense at the end, but there's a really good connection question. Uh, I'm going to introduce this idea of connection questions in a minute, but here is a good example of that. Go back and look at this if you're looking for a connection later on. So that brings us to the end of 6.4. Again, I keep saying it, make sure you're answering the questions and check on the vocab checkups at the end. The last section from the Blossom is 6.5 on fractures and bone repair. Many of you probably have broken a bone or certainly most of us know someone who has broken a bone. It's amazing how easily and how readily the bone will heal itself. Now, it may not heal itself properly and that's why we need to get the help of an orthopedic surgeon, but Bones will oftentimes bind the ends of each other and will knit themselves together. Those are my words. But remember those osteogenic cells I described? Those osteogenic cells are activated by the fracture. And then they start to make more osteoblasts. And they will begin to go through the healing process to repair bones. Uh, bone fractures come in two basic types. One is a closed fraction. A fracture and one is an open fracture. You see the, also the word reduction. So a, a closed reduction or a closed fracture is one where the bone is still inside, 
does not poke out of the body. Uh, these bones typically will heal themselves on their own or with very little inter intervention. Open reductions are the ones that require surgery. Not only do you have to go into the body to get to the bone to fix it, but oftentimes an open fracture is one where in the actual fracturing, the bone will, will pop out and break through the skin. A big bloody mess and also leads to the potential for infection if the skin has been broken. Let's go through a few common types of fractures. Here's a great video on this. And here is a list of common fractures. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but this is a list that will make sense. Um, let me start at the bottom. And that is a closed fracture is also called a simple fracture. Okay, closed or simple. And that is a fracture, as I said a moment ago, where the, the skin remains intact. So the bone broke inside, did not stick through the skin. An open or a compound fracture is one where at least one of the broken bones tears through the skin, again, a high risk of infection if not dealt with. A green stick fracture. If you were to go out and um, go out into the forest or go out in the back, back, you know, back field someplace, and you pick up a relatively new growth, a new twig, and it's still, quote, a green twig or a green stick, and you break or try to break that green stick in half, it's likely not going to snap. If you were to take an old brown stick, an old dried up stick, and you, you know, and you, and you bend it, uh, an, an old stick will snap on it. But a green stick does not. So a green stick fracture is, an impar is a partial fracture. It does not snap all the way through. Okay, so a green stick fracture, another name for an incomplete fracture. Um, let's go to a few more. Uh, transverse and oblique, these are terms that describe the, 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 the uh, plane of the fracture. So a transverse fracture is one that's going to go straight across a long bone. So think the femur, and you're going to break that bone kind of straight across the long axis into uh, proximal and distal ends. An oblique fracture is one at an angle, right? It's going to be uh, at some angle uh, oblique. Spiral fracture. Um, this is a, a fracture that occurs when the person is in a twisting motion. This might happen if a person is going up for a layup in basketball and is coming down at sort of a twisting angle and the leg bone may may experience a spiral fracture or a person is um, doing some sort of gymnastics right and they're twisting as they break the bone unfortunately spiral fractures are also a telltale sign of child abuse uh, oftentimes a child will present to the emergency room with a spiral fracture of their radius or of their humerus and what has happened is that the the guardian has twisted their arm right twisted their arm to the point where it broke the bone in a spiral pattern so if the if a, if a child presents with a spiral fracture and they were not doing some sort of spinning activity um, it's likely that there will be some very serious questions asked of the child and of the guardian uh, comminuted, all this means is that the, the bone broke into multiple pieces, right? Not didn't just break into two pieces, but you could say it kind of shattered. It broke into many small pieces. A comminuted uh, fracture is not going to heal easily on its own. It's definitely going to need some help. An impact fracture, this is the last one here. Imagine a fracture where you have your leg extended. Imagine you're in a car, you're driving and you are in a front end collision there's an impact a very strong impact and your femur is shoved back into your pelvis that impact can break the, the neck of the femur and that would be considered an example of an impact fracture where basically you compress the bones into each other um, or falling off a ladder right uh, where there's a quite a bit of momentum as you hit the ground, the, the femur could be impacted as well. So those are just different definitions of fractures, and the video will help you with that. 
And then let's just talk really quick about what happens with bone repair. So you break a bone, right? Again, good example of the femur. We've got an oblique fracture here. Everybody see that? It's not perfectly straight across. It's at an oblique angle. If it were straight across, right, that'd be a transverse fracture. This is an oblique. So what's the first thing that's going to happen? Well, if you break a bone, it's a big bloody mess. So the first thing that's going to happen is that there's going to be a big blood clot that's going to form. Okay, a lot of bleeding and then a blood clot. That's blood clot's called a hematoma. And uh, the uh, blood cells will, the blood, or sorry, the bone cells will come around and sort of make a, uh, what's called a callus uh, or a, a little uh, uh, break around here where it kind of holds everything in. And look what happens. While you've got the cast on, so you broke your bone, you have a cast on. During that casting process, when the bones are being held together, there is a new blood vessels, right, are formed to connect the blood vessels in the bone breaking area. And before, um, before compact bone is formed, spongy bone is formed. So first spongy bone is formed, right, in here. And then over time, um, you get what's called a callus on either side. And then eventually you have a healed bone. Now this does not happen quickly. This, this, uh, this change, this healing, takes years to occur. There's small remodeling, you know, a slow process of remodeling happening. Now, after that fracture, it might be possible to see that callus, right? A callus on your skin is like a thickened area, right, of skin. A callus here is referring to a thickened area of the bone. So an x-ray might show a previous break. It may not even be obvious uh, in the center of the bone, but you might still see that callus. This is how they can look at an x-ray and say, man, this, this person's had multiple fractures. This bone has been broken multiple times. And that brings us to the end of this section on fractures and on bone repair. Now, the last thing I have for you, just a couple of slides, not more than a couple, uh, a few slides, um, popping them up here. And let me just uh, start right here with this picture. And these pictures, these PowerPoint images are posted for you right underneath this lecture. You'll see them. Uh, you're free to print them out or simply to review them as part of this presentation. Uh, but this goes through those fracture types that we just saw. So here, uh, this is a complete fracture. And before we even do that, let's talk about what bone this is. What bones are you looking at here? Okay, this is the radius. And this is the ulna. These are bones of the forearm. How do I know that? At the very top, at the proximal end of the radius, there's this perfect little circle. Um, and you'll see that in the, in the, in, as you're learning the bones. And this bone, if you were to take a look at it from the superior view, uh, it would be a perfect little circle. And if you were in geometry class, you would be able to measure the radius of that circle. So that's my clue that this is the radius. Also, um, this little bump right here, you'll be learning in the bone marking unit in a week or so, is the radial tuberosity. This is the attachment place for the biceps brachii muscle. I also see here, just to give you more clues, and this may not make sense now, but it will make sense if you're reviewing this video closer to the exam, at the distal end, I see two pointy structures, okay, and these are the structures you can feel on either side of your wrist, okay, and also I recognize that this is the distal end of the humerus, and I can see here the capitulum, which is the place where the radius articulates, and the I can also see the trochlear notch here, which is also a part of the humerus. Again, that's more than you need to know right now, but that will speak to you later uh, in, a, in a week or so. So that is a complete fracture all the way across. This is an incomplete fracture. The other name for that would be a green stick fracture, green stick fracture or an incomplete fracture. Notice it didn't go all the way through. Comminuted, many, many pieces, right? The bone shattered. Here's transverse, straight across. Here's an impact fracture. Again, think 
that the, the head of the femur has been shoved up into the pelvis and there's a fracture at the neck of the femur. Oblique at an angle and spiral, you can kind of see that spiraling uh, arrangement uh, as this bone was broken in some sort of rotational movement. In the, power, in the PowerPoint slides just before that, I have uh, just a couple of uh, definitions here of the different fractures. And while we're talking about fractures, uh, let's take a look at an x-ray on the right. Uh, this is a green stick. You can see that this fracture does not go all the way through, right? So it's intact on this side, but uh, there's definitely an incompleteness to this fracture. So that's green sticker incomplete. And now let's make sure that this picture on the left makes sense. Uh, this is certainly a transverse fracture, but it's also a simple fracture. Simple here does not refer to how easy it might be to repair, although simple fractures usually are, quote, more simple to repair. But simple re fracture is referring to the fact that the bones stayed inside, did not break through the skin. Whereas here, a compound fracture it is an oblique fracture. It is a compound fracture because you can see that a portion of the tibia has broken through the skin. So this is a risk of infection and a very painful fracture. While we're here, let's name some bones. So we have the tibia and on the outside, the lateral edge, we have the fibula. And the tibia comes down and sits on top of, this would be the talus the talus I don't have a good enough view of the other tarsals here to describe those but then remember we're gonna have the long bones of the foot the metatarsals and then there's gonna be 14 phalanges on each foot two on the hallux the big toe and three each on the other digits man those are tiny little bones aren't they think about your pinky toe tiny little bones but those little bones are long bones even though there's they're really they're, they're not very long, they are still uh, considered long bones, whereas the bones of the ankle and the bones of the wrist are considered short bones. And another slide just about simple compound and green stick fractures. So four slides here on fractures. While I'm here, uh, we just I just talked about osteogenesis imperfecta, which is a genetic disease of bone. Here's another condition. I just think this makes it interesting to look at. Um, here is a skull. You can see that. But look at all of this really abnormal growth, right? All of this abnormal growth. What you're looking at here looks like sort of a, a some sort of fuzzy thing. This is a cancer. This is an osteosarcoma. It's a bone cancer, right? It's overactive bone cells, which are forming uh, this, this really... Uh, Ab, you know, abnormal bone growth. Uh, so I just wanted to show that to you as an interesting uh, aside, but um, osteosarcoma. Now, the other slides I have here, there aren't many. Let's just go up to uh, the first one. And this is something that you've been introduced to, but I want to just hit this home, make sure you've got this. Ligaments and tendons. Tell me what sort of tissue, what sort of connective tissue makes up tendons and ligaments? And I hope you're all saying dense, regular connective tissue. Dense, regular connective tissue. Well, dense, regular connective tissue comes in three um, basic places. It's the same stuff, okay? Tendons are bands of dense, regular connective tissue that connect bone to muscle. We'll spend more time looking at tendons in a, in a next lecture or so. But tendons connect bones to muscles. Ligaments made up of the same stuff instead connect bone to bone, bone to bone. And finally, one you have not yet heard of are aponeuroses. Aponeuroses. Aponeuroses are bands, flattened sheets of the same material that connect muscle to muscle. When you get to the muscle lab next week, 
you'll be learning about the abdominal muscles. And the abdominal muscles, there are no bones in your abdomen, correct? And so how do those different muscles attach to each other? They attach to each other through aponeuroses. Same stuff. It is dense, regular connective tissue, but between muscles. Okay, so tendons, ligaments, aponeuroses, all made up of the same stuff, different places, different names. The textbook did not have uh, a great image of the histology of bone. Your lab manual did. Just wanted to make sure that this was in this presentation as well. So again, I won't review this again, but another, another uh, image all labeled for you. Now, when you look at this top image, this is a trans, what's called a transmission electron microscope, and it gives you the depth. You could actually see the depth. And for the first time, you can see the idea of these lacunae being little little uh, lakes or little divots in which the osteocytes live. And you can see that the central canal has a depth to it. Um, you don't get that appreciation when you look at a flat image in most of our histological micrographs. The one bone marking that I've already described that you cannot see in this presentation are those Volkman canals, right? The Volkman canals, again, are those canals between central canals and they do not appear here but the other structures right the lamellae the osteocytes the lacunae the canaliculi and the uh, central canals and the osteocytes all that is present in these flat images i wanted to show you a really cool image of a child's foot and how it changes over time look at this this is a nine month old look at the bones we can see the phalanges we can see the metatarsals, and we get a little bit of a glimpse of some of the tarsal bones. Is it any wonder that you can squeeze a nine months old, you know, into a shoe, right? And that, sh that foot is very flexible. The bones are not yet articulating. But I want you to see, um, here is a two-year-old, right? And then a three-year-old and a five-year-old. Look with me, just at a couple places. Look right here. See that gap? That is a growth plate. Now you can see it on many of these. Here's a great example here. Here's a growth plate. See how there's a gap in the bone? That gap under x-ray, uh, cartilage does not show up in an x-ray, right? It's the dense bones that show up as white and the cartilage shows up as the black or the shadow. So you can see there's a growth plate in a lot of these bones as they are elongating. These bones have not yet completely, you know, uh, uh, calcified or grown to their adult length. And notice how these tarsals begin to migrate and begin to form the ankle. Isn't that amazing? I look at this and I'm like, how in the world does a five-year-old even run if their bones in their foot have not yet all articulated with one another? And then when we get to the adult foot, let's look at what we see. Clearly, all the bones have articulated. They're all touching each other. This is the skeleton that we're used to looking at, isn't it? I mean, we don't we don't see this in our in our images. So I think this is a cool thing to look at. But in the adult, let me point out, the gap that we're now seeing is the joint space. So now we're seeing the joint space between the bones. Also, though, if I look around, I can see epithelial lines. See the dark, the white line, if you will. The white line, and you can see it on many of them as you look around, that white line is the epithelial line. This, these bones have, have reached their adult length. Okay, So cool pictures to look at regarding how bones elongate, especially cool to look at in the foot. And then lastly, here is a young person's uh, femur. Here is an adult femur. I just want to point out one thing, and that is uh, in the femur, this is called the head. You'll learn that soon. This is the neck, and this is the what? Correct. And notice if you were to find a if you were to find a young person's femur in your backyard, okay, kind of a gross thought, but if, if a forensic scientist or an anthropologist finds a skeleton of a young child, if they find their femur, 
the head of the femur and the greater trochanter here will be disconnected from the bone itself because there is a growth plate here and that growth plate remember is made of cartilage that cartilage is not going to be maintained so if you found a five-year-old's femur in the backyard the greater trochanter and the head would be laying next to the rest of the bone it's not until after the epiphyseal uh, plate has closed and the bone has fused that these bony structures would stay intact with the bone. So in an adult femur, the head and the greater trochanter would be found as one contiguous piece. Over here, what's this bony projection? Right, that is the lesser trochanter. So this big bump is a greater trochanter and this is the lesser trochanter. And just a couple words, right? Um, that there's constant remodeling going on in your bones throughout your lifetime. Here in my slide, I say that 20% of the skeleton is replaced every year. Lawson textbook said five to 10%. I don't know that either number is perfect. Just know that the skeleton is constantly being replaced and modified as we age. And last slide, before I talk about the curvatures, is, and we all have experienced this, and this is just a little tiny bit of physiology to kind of make this interesting, but you all probably know, and you've all experienced this, that most girls stop growing somewhere in middle school, right? They kind of reach their adult height in middle school, whereas guys continue to grow taller throughout high school and some uh, boys will grow into their college years, will even grow taller. What's going on? Here's the deal. Ladies, think back. You probably reached your adult height within 18 to 24 months of the onset of menses, right? Because with menses, with menstruation and menstrual cycles, comes estrogen levels surging through your body. Estrogen, happen, it just happens, stimulates the ossification, stimulates the closing of the epiphyseal plate and the formation of the epiphyseal line. So within 18 to 24 months of the onset of menstruation, you stopped growing, your bones reach their adult height. Whereas, guys, testosterone actually stimulates the cartilage in the growth plate to grow faster. So this is why the guys get that growth spurt and while they continue to grow longer or, or elongate uh, later in life than do women. So I think that's an interesting little fact. And as I've said, there are lots of changes that occur in our skeleton. I've shown you a couple of diseases uh, like Paget's disease and osteogenesis imperfecta. We've talked about osteoporosis. We've said how bone structure is changing throughout life. Here are three examples, and this is our end, Three examples of vertebral changes, changes in the vertebral column that are pretty common. Um, two of these were mentioned early in the Blossom in the very first section. And the first one is scoliosis. Uh, scoliosis is an abnormal lateral curvature. Basically, um, the, the, the spinal, the, the, the body is, uh, the, the vertebra are growing faster, if you will, than the height. Uh, this is more common in young women, and I'll show you a picture of this in a moment, but this is the lateral curvature of the spinal cord, or spinal column, sorry, the vertebral column. Then, um, lordosis is a exaggerated lumbar curvature. This is in the lower back, in the lumbar region, and oftentimes called sway back, and this is uh, most commonly seen in pregnancy and in obesity. Right? There's a lot of pressure put on the lower back, and I'll show that to you in a moment. And then kyphosis, this is an exaggerated thoracic curvature. This gives you the classic hunchback look, and this is more associated with aging. Not all people will have kyphosis, but most individuals will experience some sort of thoracic curvature uh, that is classic of kyphosis. Now, this can get much, much worse. So you've seen some individuals who are bent over significantly because of very advanced kyphotic changes. Here's lower doses. Again, pregnancy as an example, lots of lumbar curvature, pregnancy or um, uh, obesity will cause this curvature. 
This curvature is also classically, we'll see this later in the course, but this lordosis pinches some of the nerves that travel down to the leg and during pregnancy and many people with, uh, with obesity will complain about sciatica or sciatic pain as that nerve gets pinched it travels down the back of the leg and causes dysfunction and, and, dis and pain down the back of the, of the thigh and down the even all the way down the foot and then on the right we have scoliosis this is that lateral curvature of the vertebral column notice if it's dramatic enough that it also can change the musculature of this person um, i always mention my my daughter who is uh, uh, now a physician um, has uh, not a significant but has some scoliosis uh, she's also an elite equestrian or was and uh, during those years when she was doing junior olympic equestrian some of the judges would notice uh, in her competition that she was a little off center on the horse and that off-centeredness was really just her scoliosis kind of showing its ugly self. And uh, it was something that she couldn't, couldn't really correct. As a child, she wore some braces or some night braces to try to slow down these changes. To look at her, you wouldn't notice it, but it does create some discomfort. So she specifically chose her medical career um, not to go into a field where she'd be sort of hunched over all the time. So thinking about doing surgery um, was not a choice for her. So she went to emergency medicine where she's actively moving all the time and is not hopefully going to have any uh, issues with her scoliosis causing any additional pain or discomfort or dysfunction. So my friends, that does bring us to the end of uh, the skeletal system presentation. Again, this was uh, chapter six, 6.1 through 6.5, plus those additional slides. And I will post this in the uh, exam two folder.